What we're seeing now is a push from an ultra conservative majority on the United States Supreme Court to reverse those decisions and get prayer back in school and allow teachers to indoctrinate young students. And I think that's the difference is is the makeup of the court and this movement of Christian nationalism in our country that really wants to impose a theocratic worldview on American citizens and live by certain dictates that not everybody in our country adheres to. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams, coming to you from the East Coast this time, Cape Cod. I write a blog named May It Please the Court and have three books out titled How to Get Sued, The Sled, and my new book, How Would You Decide? 10 Famous Trials That Changed History. You can find all three on Amazon. In addition, we have a new podcast miniseries, In Dispute, 10 Famous Trials That Changed History. It's currently featured here on the Legal Talk Network and on your favorite podcasting app. Please listen and subscribe. Well, the separation of church and state has always been a contentious topic in political circles. Now, more than ever, we are seeing religion and our government collide in our classrooms and before the Supreme Court. On June 19, 2024, this year, Louisiana Governor Jeff Landry signed into law legislation requiring a poster-sized display of the Ten Commandments in large, easily readable font in all public classrooms from kindergarten through state-funded universities. This new law, not surprisingly, was instantly met with opposition questioning its constitutionality and lawsuits soon followed. Supporters of the law claimed it was not solely about religion, but also had historical significance. So today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we'll discuss Louisiana's Ten Commandments classroom law, we'll discuss the separation of church and state, and what this could mean for classrooms across the country. And to help us better understand today's topic, we're joined by Rebecca S. Markert, Vice President and Legal Director at Americans United for Separation of Church and State, leading a team of attorneys working to protect the constitutional principle of separation between church and state. Rebecca has overseen more than 80 church-state cases and coordinated and drafted amicus briefs in federal appellate courts across the country, including the Supreme Court. Rebecca is also co-host and creator of the We Dissent podcast, popular monthly podcast featuring secular women attorneys discussing true religious liberty and their work to keep religion and government separate. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me. Rebecca, tell us about your role as vice president and legal director at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. What is it that you do? My role at Americans United as legal director means that I manage a team of attorneys who work in the courts to protect the constitutional principle of separation between church and state. We have two litigation attorneys, one non-litigation attorney, a staff attorney who handles complaints short of going to court, and two legal fellows who assist our litigation attorneys and um, several law student interns who help with our work as well. So I'm presuming that you want to keep church and state separate. Um, Give us a little bit of history about where that comes from and, you know, to use a current term, originalism. (laughs) Sure. Well, you know, as many people will be (laughs) very quick to point out to me, um, the term separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. And where that comes from is actually from a letter that Thomas Jefferson penned in 1802 to the Danbury Baptists, where he explained that the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution created a wall of separation between church and state. And that writing was then later used in a court case that was heard before the Supreme Court in the late 1800s, Reynolds versus the United States. And the court in that case wrote that Jefferson's writing was to be thought of as the most authoritative interpretation of what 
the First Amendment and particularly the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment means. And so that's where we get this foundational principle that religion and government should be separate. It is also one of the ways that our Constitution guarantees equality and that every person is equal before the law. If we are all allowed to believe as we wish and freely, then we are all really equal as United States citizens. Well, the First Amendment itself, basically it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then it goes on to the rest of the First Amendment, but that's what it says about the religion. So how is it that the separation of church and state devolves from Congress not being able to establish a religion or prohibit its free exercise? Well, most of the rights in the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the United States Constitution, need to be what is known as incorporated to the states and local governments. Um, And that process happened in a case known as Everson versus Board of Education in 1947, where the Supreme Court heard a case involving religious liberty disputes and declared that the through the 14th Amendment, the First Amendment Establishment Clause was incorporated to the states. So it's not just a prohibition against Congress or just a prohibition against setting up a national church or an official religion. It involves much more than that and does apply to all state actors, whether they are in the federal government, state government, local government, or municipal government. I presume it also applies to school districts who want to put the Ten Commandments there. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Um, School districts um, are also government entities, so they are considered state actors under the law. And so they would be prescribed from doing anything that violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. So what was your reaction to Governor Landry's move to put the Ten Commandments into classrooms in Louisiana? That's an interesting question because, of course, it is appalling that we are in 2024 and living in a pluralistic society that is growing more and more diverse, particularly when we look at religious identification of Americans and particularly young Americans, to see that there would be a push for this. It's shocking in that way. But also, given the work that I do, I've been doing this now for 15 plus years, and seen how the law has changed and how the courts have changed and how emboldened Christian nationalists really have been in imposing their particular religious view on ordinary Americans, it wasn't all that surprising, particularly after the Supreme Court terms that we've seen. I'm talking about 2022, when we had three significant religious liberty cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. And in those decisions, they did eviscerate these protections that the Establishment Clause gives to protect true religious liberty and really eviscerated the wall of separation through the Kennedy versus Bremerton decision, which involved a coach praying at the 50-yard line at public school high school public high school football games, and then also through a case known as Carson versus Macon, which involved funding to religious schools. So we sort of saw this trend happening that the Supreme Court was interested in dismantling the wall of separation and elevating certain religious privileges above others here most likely, or most often, Christianity over other religious faiths and no faith at all. And so to that extent, it really wasn't that surprising because there are a lot of government officials who saw these moves from the Supreme Court as a way to even further push religious indoctrination on every American citizen. But 
in particular public school students. Right. Well, this has been going on for some time. I mean, we could go back to a probably famous case with Clarence Darrow and the Scopes trial I mean, when yes. they <laughs> when they talked about evolution in in classrooms and whether or not the Bible should be in classrooms. How is this fight today any different than the fight that we had then? Well, I think now we are looking at, when you're talking about some of those old cases like the Scopes trial and a lot of the other school cases where there were religious liberty disputes, the court did come out on the side of religious freedom and making sure that government officials, including public school officials, were not allowed to indoctrinate or preach to this young captive audience of school children. But what we're seeing now is a push from an ultra conservative majority on the United States Supreme Court to reverse those decisions and get prayer back in school and allow teachers to indoctrinate young students. And I think that's the difference is, is the makeup of the court and this movement of Christian nationalism in our country that really wants to impose a theocratic worldview on American citizens and live by certain dictates that not everybody in our country adheres to. We talked about the original school cases. Let's kind of jump into a variation of the school cases, and that's book bans. They seem to have some religious bent to those as well. Yes, they absolutely do. Um, you know, Americans United has a strong history. We've been around for more than 75 years. Part of our history is fighting censorship in any form, um, including banning of books and library censorship. Really, one of the fundamental principles behind the First Amendment is this freedom of conscience and the ability to believe what you want and think what you want. And censoring library materials goes against that basic American principle and is something that we should all be upset about and fight against when we're faced with something like that. You know, when these religious entities come in and try to put their belief system in place, is there room for the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster? There should be. <laughs> um, you know, I think that um, oftentimes when these disputes are happening, um, they are very quick to make sure that things like the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, the Satanic Temple, those are all excluded. Um, but when you really kind of look at the reasons they're excluding them, you know, Satanists are obscene or vulgar or these, they are indoctrinating kids in a way that is disapproving um, by parents and things like that. Um, you know, they seem to think that they advocate for things like obscenity, sexuality, all of that sort of thing. Um, and that may not be the case entirely. But then they don't look at the fact that the Bible, the Book of Mormon, um, a lot of religious texts, but the Bible in particular, really have a lot of the same elements. So we look at some of the book bans in across the country, and they'll be banning books because, you know, there is a theme about sexuality or it references sexual intercourse um, and rape and incest and, and things like that that are not appropriate for public school children. But at the same time, they won't ban the Bible, which is loaded with those types of themes and topics. And There's that's really the, a big disconnect there's a wonderful book called The Harlot by the Side of the Road that cites all of those things in the Bible that should have that should never find their way into a classroom. But there's there's some pretty horrible things in the Bible and for what explanation do people give for wanting those horrible parts of the Bible in there? You know, that is the, the, the biggest question um, and is something that we should probably direct to them. But a lot of times, you know. Well, what do you hear as their excuses? 
A lot of times it really is just that this is a book that sets out a moral code um, and Christianity is more than just that. You also have to look at reading the Bible in a certain context um, from when it, the date that it was written. There are all sorts of excuses as to why they, they don't see um, how it's similar. So when we delve into this, how are the courts handling it? Are we simply getting a rejection of the separation of church and state and the language in the First Amendment? I mean, we've heard from Clarence Thomas the flag of originalism, and if you're going to go that way, why won't he adopt uh, Jefferson's words? I think it really is that they are interested in imposing their particular worldview on on everyone and that the hypocrisy that comes from a lot of these decisions and what you're pointing out here versus, you know, looking at Jefferson's words and looking at how the Founding Fathers saw the First Amendment. I mean, President James Madison also has a lot of writings talking about how he thought it was inappropriate for the government to conduct prayers and and other religious actions like that. They don't want to look at that sort of history because that's not necessarily what's important to them. What's important to them is pushing this Christian nationalist agenda on the people. And they want to attain power to do just that and get it into every aspect of Americans' lives from the public school to public parks and displays um, to just how we live our lives even privately, um, whether we want to have access to abortion care or contraception coverage and, and that sort of thing. I think you can never underestimate the hypocrisy right now at the Supreme Court in what they say they're doing in terms of judicial interpretation um, and looking at history and historical practices and understandings, but then also the real life and present outcome that they would like to have. What would you suggest someone who's upset with a book ban do in front of their school board? Definitely go ahead and complain to the school board. Um, they are public meetings and you are able to go before the school board and say your piece. Talk to other parents and members of your community who have interest in the education of our young people. And if they are also so aligned, then to go with you and speak out. I think that's the most important thing right now is we've seen Moms for Liberty and a lot of these other groups go and be active before these school boards. And we need to do the same and let these elected officials, whether they be just school board members or members of your state house or the federal legislature, we need to let them know that we are also their constituency. Their constituency is made up of more than just Christians. Um, we are very diverse, religiously diverse, country and community, and they need to be accountable to us and um, know that we don't all agree with what's happening there. I think speaking out and voting and taking those real core American activism routes is most important right now. And you know, there seems to be a very well-funded effort to advance this theory and not so much of a well-organized effort on the opposite side. What can be done, if anything? This is a billion-dollar shadow network of organizations who have had a great long game in taking over our courts, taking over our legislatures um, and the executive, and really getting into every aspect of our public and private lives. And there isn't a very good response on the other side. But in the last five years, I think things are changing. This 
area of practice, the Establishment Clause and religious liberty cases, a lot of this area had been taken for granted by a lot of people for a very long time. Now people are starting to understand, now that the courts have been captured, what is really at stake, that all of the civil rights that people care about are being undermined by this court, and that the separation of church and state is core to protecting all of those other rights that we care about. And so now there really seems to be a movement afoot to really change that course. Our organizations and coalition partners are working together stronger and better than ever in all facets, be it in the courts or in the legislatures or just in grassroots activism. Um, There is that coordination coming along. Unfortunately, (laughs) we are probably always going to be outgunned in terms of money, but not necessarily in terms of the people power. And that's what is really exciting and something that is really going to drive change. This is a very small group of individuals. And if the people who are against this, which is the majority of Americans, really get involved, wake up and start engaging in these issues, I think that we can write these courses. What Americans United has been saying for the last few years is that we need a national recommitment to the separation of church and state. And that is 100% correct. And I think a lot of people, um, even outside my professional circle, (laughs) are really understanding what the link is between the separation of church and state, and all of these other issues. Um, And starting to see what is actually happening. Well, Rebecca, we're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm joined by Rebecca Markert. She's vice president and legal director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which we've been discussing here at some length. There's been a lot of discussion lately about Project 2025, which seems to echo uh, your warning that there's a uh, deep-seated effort to infiltrate. Yes, Project 2025 is very alarming and is this 900-page manifesto of sorts that really sets out a conservative, theocratic view of what our country should look like and what the government should look like. And it goes through agency by agency and issue by issue on how they want to change things. And one of the one of the real life examples of what Project 2025, if it is allowed to be implemented, one of the real life examples of, of what that might look like is a case that Americans United is actually involved in, involving a Jewish couple out of the state of Tennessee, the Root and Rams, who went to be foster parents. They wanted to foster to adopt a child. And when they were about to do a home study, were told by a Christian foster agency that is funded by their state tax dollars. Um, It's an organization that's contracted by the state to provide foster care services, they were told by that Christian agency that they would not be eligible to be foster parents because they had made an executive decision a while ago that they would only allow foster parents who were, who shared their Christian faith tradition and belief system. That type of situation, that discrimination that they faced is something that Project 2025 would allow and advance if it were allowed to be implemented because they want to have faith-based organizations to have all sorts of exemptions, which is really just allowing those organizations to discriminate on any reason. Um, Here it was religion, but it could also be based on sexual orientation, discriminate based on gender identity gender status. And and that's a horrifying world to live in. And 
I'm really heartened to see that there's a lot of talk about Project 2025 and that Americans United was a driving force behind educating Americans about what this manifesto intends to do. Well, Rebecca, we've just about reached the end of our program, so it's time to wrap up and get your final thoughts as well as your contact information regarding Americans United. So if our listeners want to get involved, they can reach out to you. Sure, sure. So you, if you are interested in learning more about Americans United, we would love for you to visit our website, au.org. There you can find my contact information and get in touch if there's anything that um, you would like to talk about in terms of church-state violations that you see in your own community. And also, if you want to learn more about religious liberty issues in our federal and state courts, I would encourage you to listen to the podcast that I host, We Dissent. You can find it on wherever you get your favorite podcasts, but you can also go to our website, we descentorg Great. And by the way, I've listened to it. It's a wonderful podcast, very interesting, and a lot of good, deep thought about these subjects. Highly recommend it. Thank you so much. Great. Rebecca, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, if you haven't figured it out by now, here's Craig Grants on today's topic. I am solely in favor of the First Amendment, the way that it was written in the Constitution, the way that Jefferson, Madison, and our founding fathers originally interpreted it, which is there is a separation of church and state. And it blows my mind that our Supreme Court can't understand that distinction, especially when the flag of originalism is being waved so broadly and widely with all of the recent decisions that are being made, because originalism then would go with separation of church and state. Well, that's it for Craig's rant on today's topic. Let me know what you think. And if you like what you heard today, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. You can also visit us at LegalTalkNetwork.com where you can sign up for our newsletter. And if you'd like to find out more about my new book, go to 10FamousTrials.com. I'm Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Please join us next time for another great legal topic. When you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subscribers.